Well, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for attending this, uh, this uh, fifth Global Health Lecture. Uh, the speaker for this lecture is Professor Raymond Richard Neutra, whom some of you already know. So thanks a lot for coming. Professor Neutra has been spending a few days with us, so we have had the opportunity to enjoy his presence. Uh, well, Global Health Lectures, it's, uh, it's uh, lectures in which we uh, try to be together, and I think we are having uh, incre slowly increasing attraction rate. Uh, people both from Creal and ES Global, and I think that the lectures are an important element of the scientific uh, dialogue between the two institutions. So uh, I, uh, I know you are aware of this, and uh, I think that your lecture will be an important contribution to this process. Um, well, there are many reasons uh, uh, f to have Professor Neutra invited as a speaker in our global health lectures. Uh, and, and, and I think that basically uh, uh, you, you are a pioneer of environmental epidemiology. Uh, and, and and I think that uh, just um, that, that you, your character as a pioneer of the discipline, it's, it's, it's proven in, in some traits of your evolution. When it's, uh, uh, you, you have been president of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology. And I remember I, I, I listened very attend some of your interventions on ethics, on environmental health, in, when we had the meeting here in Barcelona. Uh, but uh, Professor Neutra has been also received the uh, uh, Korea Achievement Award from the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, that is a John, John Goldsmith Award. And, and that these two attributes that at the heart of Creal, it's proven by the fact that Jordi Sunye was uh, awarded John Goldsmith uh, Award uh, last, this year, and, and as some of you know, uh, Manolis Kogavinas is, I think, uh, presenting his uh, credentials as a candidate to the uh, presidency of the International Environ uh, Society of Environmental Epidemiology. So this is important. There are very important characteristics. Um, uh, Professor Neutro is, is, a, is a medical doctor. Uh, uh, he received his MD in, uh, in McGill and then uh, did a PhD and stayed as a uh, assistant professor in Harvard before moving as associate professor to UCLA. And then, he, for many years, he has been the responsible of the Division of uh, Environmental and Occupational Health uh, at the Department of Health in California. And this is leading, I understand, a very large workforce, a very large number of people, probably hundreds of people, working on environmental health issues in California. And you know California has been a leading state in the U.S. in environmental health uh, policies and initiative. Uh, just to finish, and I think that this is also related to the, uh, the very exciting title of the, this lecture, that it's a, a Socratic uh, dialogue on uh, priorities in environmental health, something like that, uh, is that Professor Neutra has worked in, a, and this, these days I enjoy it reviewing some of your contributions, and it's really, incredible. Uh, he has worked in, in most of the very difficult issues in environmental epidemiology, clusters of lung cancer, electromagnetic fields, uh, water sanitation, chemical sensitivity, and many others. And, and I think that in these fields, uh, he has made very thoughtful contributions, both in terms of methods and, and the com methodological complexity of the discipline, but also, and I think this is very important, uh, in uh, issues that go beyond the methodology, and uh, I think like ethics or the importance of contextual understanding for uh, approaching health problems. And I think that this is uh, important for the lecture of today. Uh, I know that you, you have many other passions in addition to environmental epidemiology. He has been lecturing these days in Barcelona on architecture, and, uh, and, but this is, uh, to some extent, go beyond the lecture, but you, we, you may have opportunities to talk to Raymond on these issues during the, the short uh, lunch after the lecture. So thank you very much again for being here and for contributing to the Global Health Lectures.
floor is for you. So we're going to talk about why we do things today. Uh, and we're going to uh, go far afield, probably influenced by my peculiar background that I was raised by architects and musicians, uh, and then uh, I was in environmental health research and environmental health practice. These are my parents, uh, my architect father and uh, a musician mother. Uh, I was very much involved in the publications of my father, that's me as a young guy, um, uh, in my uh, Elvis Presley phase, uh, 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 and, and my wife Peggy Bauhaus, who's here, uh, knew me at that phase, so she can vouch for, the, to, for it. Um, <clears throat> my father was very interested in the impact of environment on health, and it was really, uh, he wrote on uh, the physiology of perception and, and aesthetics, and it was really because the house was full of biological people that I ended up going into medicine. And his way of, of practicing uh, architecture for housing and schools and so forth uh, had many of the features of public health practice that, that uh, environment does impact health, that biology and sociology can help us in having good policy. It, you, you need to be cost effective in what you do so there's enough money to go around. Uh, you need to study what works and what doesn't work. Uh, there's an issue of respecting your clients and stakeholders that you're working with, that uh, one works in a team and that there's a skill of managing a team, and that uh, it's important to imagine alternative futures and then how to realize them. That, that it was important to think out of the box. Uh, and it's an issue of selling new ideas to the public. In his case, architectural ideas. In our case, getting people to ride bicycles and get off their uh, Xbox and out, in, uh, out into the nature. Uh, so my practice in public health uh, uh, after my academic practice involved a lot of controversial issues. This is a train that uh, fell off a trestle at the upper reaches of the Sacramento River in California and spilled um, metam sodium into the river and sterilized 40 miles of the river. Fish were dead. The uh, little people in the community that lived there in the middle of the night, suddenly they started coughing and their eyes watered and uh, they didn't know what was happening. And when they woke up the next morning and the sun started shining on the river and uh, converting the metam sodium into other stuff that blew up the canyon, then they started coughing and again. And we did, uh, we were, one part of the community demanded that we do a study there. Uh, and we're very worried that we would uh, be bought off by industry and whitewash the thing. The other part of the community that ran little hotels and motels uh, knew that we came from Berkeley and assumed we were all communists and going to uh, scare everybody. And so there was a lot of distrust. And uh, we had to work with that community over three years period to uh, work together to do the study and then talk about what it meant and so forth. So that, that was the, I did that for about 30 years and became very sensitized to how different people's ethics uh, influences the way they look at um, issues. So uh, one of the things that one could ask is there a different way of looking at this in the purely analytic way that we always do. Uh, and there's a tendency when you say, well, what could design thinking, and we'll talk about that in a minute, contribute to the performance of the health sector, we would tend to think of the health sector as something that cures people of disease. But of course, uh, and, and analytic thinking is what we're all trained in to, to uh, have a linear logical deduction to justify what we do 
and uh, randomized trials and other ma means to decide whether our, our hypotheses uh, uh, were, were borne out in reality. Uh, but there are other ways of thinking, uh, and uh, this book by Harry Francis Malgrave, The Architect's Brain, reviews the whole evolution of uh, how we starting to understand what the creative process is and also how the brain reacts to the environment. And the creative process uh, lights up different parts of the brain than the uh, purely logical uh, processes do. Uh, and the question is, uh, is that other way of thinking something that would be of use? Uh, design thinking is imagining alternative future scenarios that expand beyond accepted boundaries, uh, that embrace constraints but still balance the requirements of solving problems, and crafting processes and environments to accommodate those ima imagined futures. Uh, the famous uh, furniture designers Charles and Ray Eames said, we never compromise but we embrace constraints. give you an example from my father's career. He uh, was asked to design the United States Embassy in Karachi in the late 1950s. And before the building was built, he uh, went to Karachi and uh, interviewed all the important stakeholders, including some of the uh, imams uh, in town of various stripes of uh, Mohammedanism. And he discovered something interesting, that the reason that the American uh, uh, Office of General Services had gotten this piece of land so cheaply was that everybody in Karachi knew that it was haunted by a ghost. And uh, uh, yes, it was very inexpensive, but it was rather inconvenient in that it was not near any of the mosques that the Mohammedan inhabitants uh, the Mohammedan employees of the embassy would have to go several times a day to uh, pray to Mecca. And so my father uh, imagined a situation in which the uh, ghost would be placated and that there would be some other solution for the religious needs of the employees. And he asked the imams what could be done. And they said, well, there are some ceremonies that we could do to placate the ghost and make him go away. And then also it's possible to have a little mosque within, um, within the American embassy, but it has to be facing Mecca and there has to be a pond that they can bathe and uh, uh, cleanse themselves. And so that was accommodated, uh, both those things were accommodated to uh, uh, accommodate an um, imagined different future. Now, the performance of the health sector, of course, is not only cure, but includes promotion and prevention, which I think most of us in this room uh, are concerned with. But there's a very important part of the health sector, which is care, because we can't prevent everything and we can't cure everything. So uh, a creative approach to all three types of activities would be important. Then further, the, the health sector can either be looked at as an end in itself, or can, it can be looked at as one of several sectors that has a societal impact whose end result is a resilient and functioning social system. Uh, and that that social system uh, creates a high prevalence of people who are in a state of well-being, what the Bhutanese have called gross national happiness is, instead of gross national product. And uh, we'll be talking about how well-being is partly about uh, being skillful in intervening, and we'll talk about PERMA a little bit later, uh, but then there's also something about skillfully framing things that we can't change. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of beauty in the good life. 
as a beauty in some fundamental sense and beauty as a uh, signifier of social status. So uh, that's the ground that we're going to cover uh, today before we get to our dialogue. And when we finish, these are the questions. I'm going to divide the group up into four groups and simultaneously we're going to talk about these questions. Given that we all die, what causes of mortality are most and least desirable from a personal and societal point of view and why? What size of population and what proportion of old and young is desirable? Why? How could we transition to it? What democratic processes could be used to achieve a consensus about where we want to go with such a population? And then what are the characteristics of a good end of life? And what health sector policies could increase the incidence of those good ends? So in what categories of activity could the health sector deploy design thinking and more creative approach? Uh, of course, prevention. And here, uh, Peggy and I are with a professor in Bhutan with the condom man uh, a vehicle that drives around Timpu encouraging people to use condoms. Uh, health promotion, here we are about to take a paddle in the, uh, in the canals of Utrecht. Uh, of course, cure and rehabilitation, and then end of life care. So to what societal end do we do these things? And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some experience that Peggy and I had in Bhutan. Uh, Bhutan is a little country which is bordered on the north uh, by the Himalayas in Tibet and surrounded by various provinces of India on the south. And uh, this is what it looks like. You can see the Himalaya peaks going up to the 20,000 feet height in the background and uh, these terraced rice fields. And uh, we were uh, volunteering at the Royal Institute of Health to help them evaluate a, a new two-year public health program for village health workers. And uh, um, uh, th these are some of the professors and, and some of the health workers that they were in their 30s and 40s had been out in small clinics uh, around uh, the countryside. And, Thirty years ago, the uh, king of Bhutan had promised health care for all, and uh, uh, following the Alma Alta uh, declaration, had established a network of uh, rural um, health posts with these uh, health workers who could uh, uh, provide immunization, advice on sanitation, uh, deliver baby, normal deliveries, uh, and um, um, prenatal care and so forth, and, and people who were sick were then uh, triaged to regional health centers. Uh, most of the people had just a few years of training, and they've had a great deal of success with that. Um, and the ethical basis uh, for the king's promise was really duty ethics. And there we have Moses with the Ten Commandments, and, and Moses said, you should honor your mother and father even when it's not cost beneficial to do so. Uh, that uh, from that point of view, everybody, you have a duty and everybody has a right of access to available medical technology regardless of what it costs. And recently, uh, Paul Farmer has written an article uh, uh, emphasizing that kind of point of view and decrying the, uh, uh, some of the cost-effective perspectives that some people have used in global health. Um, but the king's promise was too expensive to keep. Uh, in recent years, there's been an epidemic of hypertension and diabetes and people getting heart disease and, and 
in their system, they were sending people to Bangkok to have bypass surgery, and now they can no longer afford this. So that they, just at the point when we were there, when Obamacare was being debated in the United States of whether we should add people uh, to the system, they were wrestling with how to cut back on what they were going to offer. So this is the new king and his beautiful wife. Uh, Peggy and I actually got to meet the king. He came to the institute. Uh, uh, and uh, the king had pronounced this idea that this was a Buddhist country and that they were not going to aim at gross national product, which is a materialism, but to aim at gross national happiness, which is also part of Buddhism, that, that uh, Buddhism is aimed at uh, uh, practices that would lower the incidence of mental suffering. Uh, and the more sophisticated Bhutanese know that no government can guarantee that individuals would be happy, uh, but what they can do is remove certain hindrances that lower, uh, that, that lower the probability or, or get in the way of people's individual struggle to not suffer. Uh, and that is by having a sustainable environment, a viable economy, a participatory government, preservation of their own culture, and a functional health sector. So those things could help, but ultimately the responsibility for happiness in the Buddhist perspective is uh, uh, the Eightfold Noble Path of, of Practice. So we met with Dr. Gatto, who's a Harvard-trained a surgeon uh, uh, and asked him, he was the health minister, and we asked him how gross national happiness and Buddhist uh, philosophy were guiding them in what to cut back uh, in their health sector. And he kind of shrugged ruefully and said, well, we haven't figured that out, so we got the M McKinley company to do a cost-benefit analysis for us. And uh, I was a little disappointed. I was hoping that they would have something new to offer about setting priorities. But then I thought about it and I said, well, even in socialist countries where everybody has access to prevention, cure, and care, how do we prioritize things? What, what do we do? And of course, the cost benefit approach is the utilitarian approach of Jeremy Bentham. And this is the mummy of Jeremy Bentham that you can see in University College in London. He was an eccentric guy, and when he left a lot of money to them, he, he stipulated that his mummy be in a, in, a, in a glass case there in the foyer. And he was the one who in, invented utilitarian ethics, of which cost-benefit analysis is the most concrete uh, manifestation. And what it essentially d is doing is uh, saying that what we should offer is the available technology that is cost beneficial to the patient. And that we should order all the things that we do in, in, uh, in uh, descending order. And uh, when we don't have enough money, the less cost beneficial things fall off the table. Uh, recently, uh, um, Ole Norheim and Dan Wickler at Harvard uh, have uh, written an article critiquing this approach and saying that uh, it doesn't capture the fairness kind of situation, which is always the problem of utilitarian ethics, that the most good for the most people forgets the few people. And so that they suggest modifying this a little bit to deal with that. But there is still a remaining problem even after they're tinkering with that, which is to what end is technology available? Technology, if you look at it, doesn't seem to aim at gross national happiness. What is available by and large is what is profitable. So we have daily statins in Viagra available, but a vaccine against Ebola is not available. 
uh, antibiotics for resistant microbes are not available, and a number of big uh, pharmaceutical companies have closed down their research and development efforts uh, because it's not rational for them uh, because it's not uh, as profitable as finding uh, drugs that must be used daily for chronic diseases. And then drugs for diseases prevalent in poor countries are not available, and I know some of you are working to try to correct some of that. Then the other problem, if, if you're aiming at the benefit to the patient, is sometimes what the patient wants uh, is not going to be so good for society at large. So individual parents prefer, prefer boys in China, but society needs a balance between boys and girls. And most of us would like to live a healthy life to 110 years old, but uh, if you had lots of people like me around who can barely get the uh, TV uh, uh, controller to work properly, uh, this would be a societal problem. So, um, so cost-benefit analysis to pr prioritize available technology does not aim or guarantee gross national happiness, and that raises other, well, what else could we do? So we should think about what is the societal impact of the health sector. Well, it certainly has influenced the size of the population. Uh, it has influenced the gender and age composition of the population. It has shifted causes of death. So um, everybody raise your right hand here. Everybody raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. All of you who are not going to die, keep your hand up. <laughs> All right, so uh, we, we talk about preventing death, but we never prevent death. We simply shift what you're going to die of and when you're going to die of it, you see. So we shifting causes of morbidity and shifting the prevalence of disability. Uh, and we're influencing the prevalence of meaningful and pain-free death and disability. And we're influencing the societal impact of all of this. So for example, when we prevent a maternal death, we also, uh, the, the, the uh, global burden of health approach would look at the years of life of that, uh, of that woman who got to live and to be 75 instead of dying at 25. Uh, and th they put a value on those uh, dallies that were added. But they forget about the impact on the five children that were not made orphans by uh, this intervention. And they also forget about the fact that when she got to be 75, she got Alzheimer's disease and somebody had to take care of her. So that we're uh, all these interventions have impacts that have a value implication, that, that what we're doing uh, as public health people is deeply ethically and morally involved, and we tend not to think explicitly about it. Um, so the answers to these questions are value-laden. Uh, Yes, why we prevent cure and care seems to be self-evident, uh, but we don't think why we're doing it. Uh, and we haven't imagined other values. If, if you read uh, the life histories of people 150 years ago, uh, great artists are cut down in their, in their youth by tuberculosis and, and other diseases. Life was very unpredictable then. And now we have made changes so things are much more predictable. Uh, and we, ha we do not accept things, but we also maybe don't deal with things in the way that were dealt with before. For example, in the United States, uh, it used to be uh, in the late 1800s that uh, there were lots of photographs of dead babies and, and that they that there was a whole issue of processing 
uh, this kind of event. Now death is very sanitized. We bundle grandma off to the intensive care unit and then off she goes and there's a, there may be an open casket funeral but more likely she'll be cremated and all we'll see is an urn. So all of these things have ramifications in, in the kind of life that we lead. And then we haven't imagined a democratic way that these values might be changed if we needed to change them. How would we move, uh, how would we pri prioritize things, how would we decide, uh, given that we now are controlling things so much, will we just stumble into what the society is like or will we have some manner where uh, uh, we think about it together? And can design thinking help these value-laden things? So we talked about promotion, cure, and care. We talked about the fact that the performance of the health sector is, uh, can be viewed as an end in itself, self-obvious, or it can be looked at as something with a societal impact uh, that in turn influences individuals. So then what are the drivers of well-being? And we'll talk about the skillful intervening and the skillful framing and the role of aesthetics. There's something called the serenity prayer. I don't know whether that you know about it in Spain here, but it goes something like, God, give me the serenity to accept what cannot be changed, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, so, the Buddhists classically are very strong on the skillful framing of uh, mental suffering uh, is all about how we frame something. Let's say that I had an accident and became quadriplegic. Uh, I have the ability to frame that thing either as something where I'm continuously raging against what has happened to me or whether I look for the positive in my situation and get on with life. So that's skillful framing. But then there's all kinds of things that we can do. And this man, uh, Martin Zeligman, has uh, written a book called Flourishing, uh, which summarizes a whole body of evidence from positive psychology, uh, where people have uh, interviewed people about uh, their lives, of how contented they are uh, with the life that they have been leading not how happy are you this very instant, but rather how satisfied are you uh, with your life. And then they find that, that there are drivers of this, there are risk factors for this that are quite strong and that they are orthogonal, that they're different from each other, they're independent and uncorrelated. Uh, there's the issue of pleasure, uh, certain um, enjoying a good uh, a dinner of of tapas on the Rambla Catalunya. Uh, there's the issue of engagement, of, of doing work which, which uh, pulls on your signal strengths. Uh, and there's the issue of relationships. There's a relationship of, of that what you are doing has some significance to people other than yourselves. And then the satisfaction of achieving things like Jordi where people give him um, the Goldsmith Award and saying, pat you on the back and recognize you appropriately for what you're doing. Um, now aesthetic receptivity and creativity uh, is also part of that and enters into all those domains. And so we'll talk about that now. There's an interesting book by Nancy Etkoff uh, on the, on the evolution of aesthetic feeling, and it's entitled The Survival of the Prettiest. Uh, and she points out that animals and humans have always uh, adorned uh, themselves to attract the other sex, and that the, uh, the more adorned and more beautiful are more likely to, uh, um, to uh, reproduce. Uh, and indeed, aesthetics continue to be a marker of social class. Uh, and uh, uh, people in power have used beautiful things to 
outrank themselves. We were at the Palau Guel, which is certainly an example, a wonderful example. And, and artists have often depended on the need of powerful people to uh, show how beautiful they could make things to uh, uh, allow those artists to work. And that kind of aesthetics has losers and winners because the ones who can't afford Palau Guel don't feel so good. Uh, but then there's some win-win aesthetics as well. Uh, the uh, Etkoff points out that there are uh, studies show that there's certain kinds of environment that people like, that they, they, they like to have uh, an environment where they can see whether the predators are coming or not uh, and feel secure. Uh, my father, uh, as an architect, felt that uh, we evolved in an environment where there was a very clear horizon, that ho uh, horizontal and vertical was something that r required clear demarcation. And that, in fact, of course, in our inner ear, we have an organ that tells us exactly what's up and down and, and what's horizontal. And so in his architecture, uh, there were very clear lines of, of uh, vertical and horizontal and an opening into a protected kind of environments that people would feel comfortable in. Um, now, like any property, uh, there will be some kind of population distribution of uh, aesthetic proclivities. And um, uh, some people have, it's not so important, and some people it's very important, and there's something in the middle. So I'm now going to do a survey. Everybody put your hand up again. All hands up, all hands up. Okay, I'm going to give you a description of a person, and if this description fits you, keep your hand up, otherwise put your hand down. So uh, this kind of person is able to play an instrument or to sing, and it's very important to them to do that well. Okay, now keep those of you who are keeping your hands, look around. Not, not so many of us. Uh, so we need to be treasuring these rare outliers, right? Because uh, people like this guy um, contribute something to the worth, uh, to the self-identification of the community. If you go to Vienna, there are little plaster statues of this guy uh, 200 years later. With, we're the city that, that had Beethoven in it, right? And uh, of course, it's like, you know, uh, Messe or, or any, any, any outlier on anything is important to the community. But education can influence the average as well, right? So uh, this is a picture of uh, Tanglewood outside of Boston. And uh, it's not so hard in Boston or in Vienna uh, to assemble a crowd like that, but in Nairobi it wouldn't be so easy, or in Canton, Ohio, it wouldn't be so easy. So that uh, the education and norms can make uh, aesthetic pleasures more or less uh, nurturing to the society. Peggy and I had the delight of spending uh, 10 days in Kyoto during, apple, uh, during cherry blossom time. And there is a habit there that everybody goes out to have picnics and drink sake and enjoy the, um, the cherry blossoms. And this is a very important uh, cohesive thing for the society and comes about through um, formal and informal education to appreciate that in a way that uh, you wouldn't see um, in Sacramento, California. So the social function of aesthetics, there's this winner-loser function, sexual attractiveness, maker of social status, but then there are the win-win functions, the contribution to well-being and PERMA. So pleasure can be the ability to uh, appreciate a, a view that an architect has provided. This is the Jungfrau in, in Switzerland, a house that my father designed. Uh, 
Engagement, uh, this is a, a traditional artist in Bhutan, totally engaged in his ability to decorate the houses. It was interesting. We talked to uh, our friends in Bhutan and said, uh, why do people decorate their houses like this? Uh, is it so in, in, in San Carlos, California, we have big competitions for Christmas decorations. There's a street where they have tens of thousands of lights and they get a, the, the Americans were very competitive so that there's a, a prize for the city for the, the block that has the most lights. So is, is it like that? And he said, no, no. He, he said, I said, what would happen if you didn't decorate your house? And he said, well, your neighbors would think you were very selfish not to adorn your house for their benefit. Um, Relationships. This is my son, who's a very good uh, Brazilian uh, jazz bassist at a at a block party, and uh, so building relationships through aesthetics of music, meaning uh, these folks in Utrecht are are rehearsing uh, Handel's Messiah for a religious ceremony, and then achievement. And if this guy looks somewhat familiar, it's because he's my dad. Uh, and and uh, 60 years ago, he was recognized for achievement for what he was doing. Came to the United States as an immigrant in the 20s with my mom, uh, worked with Frank Lloyd Wright, and had a different idea uh, than Ruskin's idea, which would probably be the modernista idea, that beauty is the adornment of the utilitarian and that only handicrafts are noble. Uh, and also influenced by the theory of the leisure class by Thorsten Veblen, who said that uh, the powerful people have the conspicuous consumption of space, materials, craftsmanship, and historic reference. And so my father's generation, and here in, in Barcelona, you can go to the Casa Bloc and see what Josep uh, Sert did to say, no, you can have a beautiful thing that does not have the conspicuous consumption of space, materials, or craftsmanship, or historic reference. And so this is where the public health kind of approach came in, that educating the public to appreciate and to create affordable beauty, uh, using nature as an inexpensive beautiful thing, uh, and to do it in housing, schools, and medical facilities. So, of course, the Japanese have a great tradition in this, the Hispanic tradition is great in this, uh, in, in, in housing. This was, in 1932, this was the house that I grew up in using uh, industrial materials in opening up uh, the place to nature uh, with roof decks and uh, catching the uh, mountains uh, uh, in the distance, uh, uh, bringing water pools under a pane of glass inside of the house and applying this to apartment living uh, and applying it to schools. This was a, a 1926 uh, project for a prefabricated metal school that opened into gardens uh, like this um, uh, with lots of activities that involve nature. Uh, neighborhoods that uh, encourage walking uh, away from traffic inexpensive uh, furniture, and uh, the idea being that there was a role for the aesthetics in PERMA, pleasure, engagement, relationship, meaning, and achievement. So can design reconcile individual and societal goals of health of the health sector? Uh, my father thought so. He wrote a book, Survival Through Design, uh, and was it, of course, that was what he did, was imagining alternative futures. Uh, imagining futures with uh, an evolutionary aesthetics, uh, accommodating well, how we do and socialize all social classes. And we're seeing some of this now. This is the American Institute of Architecture has published this book on healthy housing and, and neighborhoods, uh, evidence-based architecture, if you like and town planning, uh, reimagining the curative and end of life setting and what happens there. Um, 
course, the Navajos were interested in, in aesthetics and in curative things. Uh, we're starting to have evidence-based hospital design. Uh, so how would we go about imagining a compatible health sector? Uh, a kind of a science fiction imagination of a functional and resilient society with a sustainable size, a workable age and gender composition, a desirable pattern of mortality and morbidity, and a desirable setting for death and disability. Uh, what health sector practices would be compatible with these imaginary societies? Interestingly enough, uh, Neil Stevenson, the uh, interesting science fiction writer, recently got together with the University of Arizona and published this book with a series of chapters of imaginings of a future and better uh, society. Another person who has uh, been very interested in this is Carl Gerasi, the chemist who developed the progesterone that uh, was uh, orally uh, absorbable and led to the birth control pill. And he's written a number of interesting uh, uh, plays that raise the ethical issues of the new reproduction in which it's possible, for example, for a young epidemiologist to harvest her eggs and put them in deep freeze and wait until she has finished, uh, gotten tenure in her academic position and then uh, could, at the age of 50, uh, deliver a baby uh, fertilized by some sperm from her husband that had always been uh, frozen and what the ethical implications of these possibilities are. Uh, but of course, once we do that, we would need to check our imagination by, by seeing whether what worked. So this is the ground we've covered today. And now, uh, what I would like to do, we have, well, we have about 10 minutes.